So we're at Sutra 1.26. Unconditioned by time, Ishvara is the teacher of even the most ancient teachers. Although all knowledge is within you, and you need to get it from out, and you need not get it from outside, somebody is still necessary to help you understand your own knowledge. That is why a teacher or guru is necessary. He or she helps you go within and understand yourself. <coughs> To help you, your guru must know some, something, him or herself. From where did your guru get that knowledge? It must have been learned from somebody else. There must be a chain of gurus. Then who is the first guru? There may be hundreds of thousands of gurus, but there should be a primary one. There should be an infinite reservoir of knowledge from which all knowledge came in the beginning. That's why Patanjali says the Supreme Purusha, or is Ishvara is the guru of the gurus. So Ishvara Pranidhana, or devotion, to, to the all-knowing Ishvara is another method for obtaining samadhi. It is the emotional path, which is easier than other methods mentioned before. Just surrender yourself, saying, I am thine, all is thine, thy will be done. The moment you have resigned yourself completely, you have <clears throat> transcended your own ego. We try to practice yoga with our egos. Oh, I can concentrate. I can penetrate this object. I can empty my mind. All these ideas of I can should become I cannot. We should become completely resigned. When we say I can, we are speaking as a part of nature. Once we say, I can't do anything, it is you, we have risen above nature. That is a simple and safe shortcut if you can do it. Ultimately, nobody can achieve eternal peace by doing something with the mind, which is part of nature. That supreme joy can only be acquired when you rise above nature by complete surrender. Then you transcend nature and understand God in the transcendental state. Once you transcend, you know, you know that you were never involved in nature. Big or small, you are completely pure and free. Then you become one with the transcendent God. In that state, as Jesus said, I and my Father are one. You can never say that as Mr. So-and-so, with 150 pounds of flesh and bone and five, six height and curly hair, which I can say, I and my father are one. The pure I who is uninvolved and free from nature. That freedom comes once you surrender yourself completely to God. In our ordinary lives, we have yoga, union with nature, but now we want yoga with God. We have union always, but our union with Prakriti should be changed to union with God. Union with God is the real yoga. So now you can see the connection between the devotional side of the religious teachings and yoga. There is no difference between religion and yoga. Yoga is the basis of all the religions. With the light of yogic understanding, you can walk into even the difficult corners of the scriptures and understand every religion well. So reading that, um, to me, it's very easy to understand. It's also very hard to really follow and get there. And then um, I wanted to read a, a small part from another translation, which says, I'm just going to read the end of it. In reality, it is this light of God that is the true guide. The inner light is not a person, but it, it dispels the darkness of ignorance, enabling us to see through the wall of false identification, attachment, aversion, and fear of that. Attaining union with this inner guide is the goal of yoga. Once we decide to employ all of our resources, physical, mental, and material, to attain this union, the inner guide arranges for a guide in the external world to come forward and pave our way for the inward journey.
Ashley just joined. Um, so finding full surrender and getting of the, I can do this and I got that. Oh, I can't see Adriana. Um, I think is, hi Adriana, hi Ashley. Morning. Morning, so we just read through 126, which is about getting, it's, um, to me it speaks about devotion and getting out of the I got this and I can do this. And if I keep showing up, and working hard and sticking by it and more switching over to fully surrendering and trusting that this higher power, the universe has got that, has got us. And if we stop fighting and really surrender to that, then we will do that, be able to do everything that we need to get done. And um, like a lot of sutras, I have to... Good morning. A lot of sutras. Sorry. Huh? That's okay. I couldn't see you in the waiting room. Um, was it 22 to 24? No, we're at 26. Uh, so what did we do? Didn't we do 24 yesterday? Oh, so you 25, 26. Okay, sorry. I'm going to mute myself. Sorry. It's okay. Um, it also had me thinking about the importance of remembering that our teachers are not the main teacher and how we should not put any teacher or ourselves on a pedestal. Anyone else? Can I comment? Of course. I like Satchitanandana, but not everything in his translation um, always landed quite right with me uh, just because I'm more of the Guiana lineage. Like it's a, I, um, I don't agree that yoga is a religion. And I think the majority of a lot of philosophers would not agree with that, that it's really, um, I mean, what he said about it making you more understanding of all religions and it creating space for all religions is definitely true but it's a different it's a different thing it's like an experiential thing it's a philosophy according to the way i was taught where um, it says even from like a bhakta lineage i i mean like it's not it's not really considered a religion i don't think that's a great word to use and you know there's there's so many references i think you guys were talking about this yesterday that pam has a hard time with the connotations of god because it insinuates like only the personalized view is the right view but really there are there are different legs of yoga just for those who are like just starting to study this stuff where there's also an impersonalized view of this where it wouldn't we wouldn't be using that particular name it would be we would say Ishvara. it's like this universal power uh, and i think like when we're when we're thinking about surrender it can for for me personally it's hard to think of surrendering to like a personalized view of this but an impersonalized view makes more sense to me so i just wanted to mention that and then another thing about about guru as an external is in a lot of traditions it's not it's not meant that the guru is ishvara it's meant that the guru is an emanation or representation in physical form that's meant for us to be able to sort of like practice on if that makes any sense um, like you're supposed to have a really when you do choose to initiate with a guru which is different than someone showing up and just um, like a tiksha guru would be somebody who's 
you know, teaching you the information, but you're not in that state of choosing to surrender to that person. A lot of people I know who have initiated, when they do initiate, it's after they've seen this teacher for a long time and they know that they're very good and very moral and upstanding and like it's like only then do they make the decision that they can trust in this person to surrender i feel like surrender has this connotation of like i'm giving up all autonomy to this other being and and i think that um you know guru gets a bad rap because of bad people who stepped into the position but it's almost like we've gone to such an extreme in in recent times led by ignorance that there has to also be like I, I don't know if I'm being I'm I'm very tired I don't know if I'm like all over the place with these thoughts but like we it's like um with yoga like in the west we're like oh here's this yoga oh it's gonna make my body really great and then we all kind of had to ricochet over to the other side of like no there's a spiritual aspect that's really really important but then we had to like eventually go to both extremes to find the middle point where it's like all important i think with gurus there was like oh the guru is all knowing the guru is god right and that like wasn't right and then we ricochet to the other point where like, you shouldn't have a guru. Don't believe in any of these teachers. No one outside of you can help you, you know, but we, where that's not right either. Like there has to be this sort of middle ground where Ishvara is showing up in many different forms and emanations to bring you to that inner guru, that inner state of understanding of all things. But it, it's all, it's all important is my point and not every guru is infallible and gurus aren't meant to be worshipped but they are meant to be there's like a level of respect because if we show them enough respect then they pretty much like give us all the secrets of the universe <laughs> uh that's all i have to say about that <laughs> i have a quick question so hello can everybody hear me yes rich speaking by the way good morning so Ish Ishvara, it sounds to me like Ishvara, and um, I just joined yesterday, it sounds to me like Ishvara is phenomenon, like the phenomenon of our lives, the phenomenon of trees, the phenomenon of the whole experience of being in the universe. So when he's talking about yoga being religion, I personally took that as yoga being the getting you connected with the the divinity the union and thus that being maybe the principle of religion or should be but mm. in that connotation i see what you're saying i mean how that is still kind of assuming that religion kind of has a basis right there and, <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I, right and i know we spoke about religion a whole bunch yesterday and like the confusion and the semantics of it but i want to pose that question like what is that that definition of religion for you guys i, I but i don't want to beat a dead horse because i always thought the divinity was that and it, it only comes to everybody's personal experience mm -hmm. so the guru the guru it's like you know how let's say today in modern society how you you're starting to see certain major religions kind of start to lose their 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 power so to speak um but you see kind of this age of information even though not always pure but everybody is kind of their own guru and everybody could kind of navigate the world and, and gain information a little bit differently so i kind of want to ask like what's everybody's definition of religion and uh, i i don't know if that's too lofty of a question in this group um Rick, yes um where it says uh yoga is the basis of all the religion and maybe because we've talked about this like in yoga teacher training too like the that, that's yeah. what resonated with me that it's it's not yeah. a specific religion it's the it's the philosophy as of 
bringing us to something higher and to the universe or divinity or whatever, whoever wants to call it and how it resonates with different people and how, because we're able to open up to that, maybe through the practice and through meditation, then when you read, like to, that's how it spoke to me, like anything from any different um, scripture, it can be applied. Like what are you reading from the, like about Krishna or reading about Jesus, but being able, because you, you come to that space where you start mm -hmm. opening up to something bigger than us, mm -hmm. be able to just apply it as that, as something that's bigger than all of us, that's within mm -hmm. each and every one of us. Right, right. That, yeah, that's what I vibe with too. So kind of like, I don't know, exactly like what Amanda is saying. And I, I was surprised to read like um, God, God and so many like different verses in this book rather than applying to it as more of a universal thing. Well, because it's his translation, right, into English. Yeah. Like if you look at the Sanskrit, it, it doesn't say like... Um, a specific emanation. It says a shvara, right? It's shvara. On it, right? It says a shvara. So I think that, you know, like there are bit, there are thousands and thousands of names for a shvara and all the different aspects of it. But when you say a shvara, it's like the whole of it. Mm. Which I guess in some people's version of, of quote unquote God, it, that's what it would look like. But it's, um, right. I feel like God can have a very limiting the word can have very limiting for some people. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And religion does the same thing. There's almost this insinuation that there's some kind of like dogmatic thing around it. I don't know. But again, it's like, it's very hard to translate Sanskrit into English because like one Sanskrit word has like uh, paragraphs of English to explain what it is so I, mm. I shouldn't criticize so. but just I just wanted to make that point about the idea of guru in our culture how we've I mean like what he's saying like it'll be brought the people will be brought to you and I, and I don't have to say out of personal experience yeah you can go and look at all the texts on your own and it's so much I don't know just easier to have a lineage that spans back thousands of years it's like if you don't understand you can ask your teacher and if your teacher doesn't understand they ask their teacher and there's a humility that comes about from that because it's like any grace that I have any good information that I have any ability that I have comes from my teachers right and then they, then they won't take credit either like that's a good that's a good guru in my opinion like they say no it's by the grace of my teachers oh it's by the grace of my teachers and it's like it, i think when we get to that ego that's what he's saying about like transcending ego mm. right. right the ego is material so a lineage helps give you that ability i, I feel well if if you um read i didn't read the the way the um sanskrit part is broken down so it's and I'm probably going to butcher this, but sa means he, purvasam, of the ancients, api, even, guru, teacher, kalena by time, and anavacheda, unconditioned, uncut from. So it translates to he of the ancients, even teacher, by time, unconditioned or uncut from. Which is right, like he's not a pala. Like it, it's not anything that's material. It's like not cut from the material the way our bodies and minds are. It was like before there was and ever is, and like because all the texts are like very vague like that. Like it's everything, but it's nothing. And it's and it's um, it's beyond time, but it is time, and <laughs> it's like. Like time emanates from it, but it is beyond time. It is not cut from time. It is not cut from the material, but the material emanates from it. That makes sense. That makes sense. <clears throat> um, Rich Richard, I think for me, speaking to your question, I think for me the difference is is in the word and the connotation of the word religion that I think what 
religion can mean a devotion, mm. but I think organized religions mm. is different. That's a different thing to me. Um, so having a religion or following a religion doesn't necessarily mean for me an organized religion. I was brought up in an organized religion and it was very lovely for me. Um, but as I grew up, um, I guess I started to see the difficulties with that. I was brought up in Scotland um, where there's huge animosity between Protestant and Catholic. And um, even though my upbringing was very pleasant, <laughs> I, I, as I, as I got older, I saw the conflict I, and I saw it as <clears throat> not religion itself causing the conflict, but the organization of religion that caused the conflict and still does. And so I kind of backed away from that. And yoga has given me a way to approach religion, if you want to call it that. <laughs> it's just a word. It's been right. given me a way to approach a higher power um, without, without having to encounter the dogma of an organized religion. Um, <clears throat> I feel like as I used to enjoy the experience of church on a Sunday, um, which I haven't done for a very long time, but I get that same enjoyment from this and from practicing on my mat and from, it fills me up the same way. It fills me up in the same way. One of my ministers many, many years ago said something that <clears throat> resin still, you know, stays in my mind as a guru, I guess, as a, as a guide. Mm -hmm. He was a leader and he was a guide for me. Um, said that church should be like going to a gas station to fill up. Uh, mm -hmm. He said a petrol station. Because we were in Scotland and we call it petrol there. But, um, <clears throat> <laughs> not gas. But he, you, you're filling up every time you go um, because you get depleted. And that's what yoga does for me. Yeah. It fills up each time I practice, each time I sit down to read the teachings. <clears throat> and, and, and aren't the spiritual teachings in books, aren't they also our gurus? We go back to whatever teachings we've chosen for, that speak to us for now. Those are also our teachers um, as well as people. <clears throat> So, that, well, that's, that's my take on, on your question. Very poignant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I share? Go ahead. I feel like this is, this is like when you try to trick your baby into eating something they don't like. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> it feels like you give them a spoonful of the fruit, right? And then you give them a spoonful of the thing they don't like because you're trying to get them, you're trying to get them to eat the thing that's good for them. And I feel like, I feel like he's like, oh, you're Purusha. So you're Purusha and there's Prakriti, right? And then, or there's these, he starts off with the pear, you know, with the, with the, <laughs> the baby food pear or the baby food banana. And he's like, this is Purusha and this is Prakriti. <laughs> and then it goes, your next spoonful is like, well, you're Purusha. And then it goes from like, you're Purusha and actually there's another Purusha that's bigger than you. <laughs> it's like little by little, I'm getting spoon fed this um, very complicated, difficult to reason with my, my human brain. My, like my own brain is very limited. So it's difficult to conjure or imagine with my mind what it is he's actually talking about. So it's like he spoon feeds me these ideas of <laughs> what God is and why, why maybe I feel God in certain moments. And I just felt that it was very interesting how he's how you how we start off like Purusha. You were saying one word in Sanskrit can mean many things, and and I always thought of Purusha as the true self. But now I'm relating to the word Purusha in like three, four different ways. So it really mm -hmm. depends. 
it really yeah. depends how, like where the, the word Purusha falls in the sentence. You know, it could, it could mm -hmm. mean so many things. Um, I do want to read this one little line from, it's, it's Sutra 25. Um, and it's this other guy. Sometimes I like his translations. And he says, um, <clears throat> so in Ishvara is the complete manifestation of the seed of omniscience. Mm. This emphasizes the worthiness of Ishvara as an object of worship. The sutra can also teach us something of the relationship between finite and infinite and serve as a proof for the existence of the infinite. There can't be finite without infinite. Close your eyes and picture a circle. What do you see around it? Blackness. Where does the blackness end? It doesn't. Make the circle bigger. What is there around it? More blackness. Where does this blackness end? It doesn't end, and so on. All thoughts, facts, conjectures, and aspirations are finite realities projected upon the infinite omniscient screen that is Ishwara. The limited self can be known because it appears against an omniscient black drop. I thought that mm. last line was like really cool. Like I- It's beautiful. Yeah, like it's almost like I know myself because I can almost like, it's not compare, the word is not compare, but it's almost like I can hold myself up to God's light to see myself. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like the seed of God is in me so that I can feel it and so that I'm, um, so that there's something that carries this human feeling to somewhere else other than here. I don't know. It's, it's mm -hmm. like I can, I, can, I can bounce off of this idea or I can bounce off of God. I can bounce off of the infinite. All my finite right. things bounce off of the infinite, kind of. Right. Let me um, jump in and piggyback off of you, Adriana, because that, it, it makes me think of like snowflakes, right, or fractals. You guys know about fractals. It's like each individual snowflake, we all know, they're, they're individual. There's no snowflake the same. You can examine, micro-examine every snowflake and they'll have a little um, different crystalline structure. But together as whole, we know it as, you know, snow. And even when you make a snowman, it's just like it's all-encompassing. It's all beautiful. But at the very, very finite um, kind of, space there's its own individuality that is also um a phenomenon of greatness and all-encompassing of the universe mm. so yeah that that's what i really mean like and i that, that's what i took from what you just read uh adriana is that our individual selves that we put limits on and given, you know, what society, whatever, you know, attachments we have or to society or to social norms or to whatever. Um, but those limits really are rubber band and don't exist, you know, because we all possess um, God in all of us. We all, we are all God because we are from God, this this experience, and yeah. and it could be it could be a rock, like all beings, like it could be a rock, it could be a tree. All of them have a story, but we're all binded. Mm -hmm. Well, in one twenty four, he describes yeah. it like. Um, uh, in other words, Ishwara is just like us, but without ignorance and its consequences. Of course, the equation read from the other side is that we are Ishwara, limited by ignorance. Um, the surrender, the I, well, not, yeah, I guess you can call it the idea of surrender, makes me think about 
um, how, and I think we can all relate to this, like when you go back to like a really bad time in your life, like a really horrible, horrifying space where you were just fighting it all and being completely stubborn. And then you finally kind of let go and go with the flow and start stuff just starts unfolding and people show up in your life and they lead you to the next step. And someone else comes and holds your hand and help you grow. And all of a sudden you look back and think, oh, holy crap, like, how did I even get out of there? Or you think that you would have never, ever been able to move forward. Yes, yet you do, you know, and you go from like this space where you're just stuck and maybe like narrow mindedness or whatever you want to call it. And, and like this huge struggle. And then you, there's one little shift and all of a sudden stuff starts changing and people show up in your life and you just move forward. Hmm. All the little boos. Hmm. It's 803 already. Uh, does anyone else want to add anything? We'll start breath work. I'm with it. All right, so we'll um, get ready for pranayama and then get into our meditation. Um, having a timer, our own timer once we start. Or maybe if you want to start it now and do 20, set it at 25 minutes so you still get the 20 minutes after we do the breath work and then you don't have to like pull out from breath work to set up a timer and then meditate. And I'm just going to mute everyone. So coming to a comfortable seat, or if you're choosing to lay down this morning, allow yourself to do that. Just closing the eyes. Allow the breath. To be nice and heavy, really filling up. Feel the expansion around the navel, the rib cage, all the way up to the chest. Exhaling deeply, let the chest drop, rib cage drops, navel squeezes in and up towards the spine. We'll take three more full rounds just like that. Inhale deeply. Exhale deeply. Inhaling deeply, feel the spine lengthen. Exhale. Releasing from the crown of the head all the way down to the tailbone. One more full deep inhale. Exhale. And we'll close, we're gonna close the right nostril only just for four rounds of breath. Inhaling deeply, expanding. Imagine breathing through the left side of the body from the hip, allow the ribs to expand, the chest up to that left shoulder. And then exhaling, releasing from the shoulder downward. Rib cage left drops. Exhale through the left side. Inhale, fill up completely through that left side. Rib expands fully. All the way up to the shoulder. Exhale, release from that left shoulder down to the left rib cage, down through that left hip. Taking two more rounds just like that. Keep expanding through the left side as you inhale. Releasing completely through the left side as you exhale. One more full round at your own pace.
And then we'll close the left nostril, inhaling through the right. Feel the right side of the body expanding. Through the hip, right ribs, up to the right shoulder. Exhaling from the right shoulder downward, all the way down through that right hip. Inhaling as you inhale to the right nostril, expanding fully through that right side, all the way up to the tip of that right shoulder. As you exhale, releasing from the tip of the right shoulder, right armpit, right side, the rib cage drops, exhaling fully through the right hip. Taking two more full rounds, just like that, at your own pace. Really focusing on expanding fully on the right side as you inhale. Exhaling and emptying out completely through that right side of the body. And then after the next exhale, just releasing the hand, finding three regular breaths. And we'll do four rounds of alternate nose breathing, starting by closing the right side, right nostril, inhaling through the left. Close and hold, exhaling right. Inhaling right. Close and hold, exhaling left. Taking three more full rounds at your own pace. And then finishing off whenever you get there, that four round, making sure to finish off with the exhale through the left nostril. Allowing yourself to settle in whenever you get there into your meditation.
And gently bring the hands to your heart center. Take a deep, deep inhale. Exhale, side out. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely, lovely, what day is it? Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Micheline. Bye. I'm going to end the meeting. Okay.